Hello again, this is uh, Paul Barish. I'm one of the three co-facilitators of the Patient Safety Certificate Program for the HMA 2015. Today I'll be addressing a webinar on the topic of characteristics of a just culture. The primary directive in healthcare is primum non nocere, or first do no harm. Although it's a fundamental tenet in medicine, we know from multiple studies that patients continue to be harmed. Our goal in this course, and indeed in this webinar, is to talk more clearly about what is the underlying culture that allows harm to continue despite the best efforts of providers. Many of the studies, both in the U.S. and around the world, is the importance of creating a blame-free environment that is actively and visibly supported and nurtured by leadership. We know that organizational culture is clearly fundamental for engaging providers and sustaining their interests, especially when we want to emphasize teamwork instead of blaming individual providers. We know about the need to assess culture, and we'll talk a lot about that later on today. What's clear from the U.S. and overseas is that many patients and families are concerned about errors in hospitals that lead to harm. This concern is not just in the hospital setting, it's also in the ambulatory setting. But the longing question from these concerns are how much of this harm is related to culture? We know, of course, that patient safety is the bedrock of quality of care. And as the Institute of Medicine has shown very clearly, quality, safety, patient-centeredness, effectiveness, and efficiency are all tightly connected. Without them, we can't provide value to the patient, value being great care, which both addresses their medical and social issues. The Institute of Medicine in 1999 to Air is Human, Building a Safer Healthcare System, highlighted the role and importance of the organizational culture to create the conditions and environment to both support individual providers as well as to create the climate for providers to work together to create safe outcomes. The six elements of the Institute of Medicine quality were safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. But of course, the glue that holds all this together is the culture and climate of care. And what do we mean by that? We know very clearly that in order to reduce adverse events and improve patient safety, we have to focus on the environment, the culture, and the forces that bring providers together and support a safe performance. We've been drawing quite a few lessons from the high reliability organizational culture, which we'll talk about in just a moment. What's clear from the definitions of culture is that aspects of organizational culture or how the providers do things here are increasingly appreciated in understanding how best to improve the quality of healthcare. In our work, as in others, we've defined organizational culture as the social and cultural phenomena in terms of the behavior and attitudes that emerge from a common way of sense-making based on the shared values, beliefs, assumptions, and norms. Clearly, this will be highly dependent based on the type of the organization, for example, public or private. Um, it could be based on the type of care delivered, say, pediatric or adults. It could be based on um, if it's, say, urban or rural, et cetera, et cetera. Growing evidence suggests that organizational culture may be relevant for not just promoting better care, but also sustaining improvement and implementation efforts. However, insights into the role of organizational culture on these things has been uneven, and so this is really part of our biggest challenges for the next decade. We know further that cultural barriers are often hidden in the underlying or invisible social constructions and attitudes of providers and the organization oversight, and therefore they're very difficult to identify and assess. A deeper understanding of the relationship between the challenges in safety and quality and their underlying cultural barriers and enablers may contribute to the development and implementation of effective and sustainable interventions. In the slide in front of me, you see an aircraft carrier, a very complex technical marvel that houses close to 5,000 people, is the size of one or two soccer fields, and yet has nearly zero adverse events over a span of 20 or 30 years. Carlene Roberts and her colleagues at Berkeley many years ago characterized this unusual technical marvel as being able to achieve that type of safety record by having a culture based on four elements. These elements have been defined the high reliability organizational cultural elements, and they include the following. Number one, an environment rich with potential for errors and harm. 
Number two, an unforgiving social and political environment in which the media and politicians would likely seize on these events if the military failed. Number three, learning through experimentation is very costly and difficult, and therefore getting it right is essential. Number four, extremely complex processes with lots and lots of social technical interfaces. And number five, complex and evolving technology that greatly outlives the individual's lives or, in fact, much beyond that. Many of these technologies will be around 40 to 60 years after they've been conceived. What's clear from the research uh, done by Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe on HROs, or high reliability organizations, is that there's five key ways in which they are able to engineer safety into their culture. Number one, a constant preoccupation with failure. And what that means is that individuals that work in these organizations are constantly fretting, how can we make sure that nothing bad happens? Number two, a sensitivity to operations, that is to say the people who are actually running the show, the people in the trenches, the people that might not be the most senior in rank or in seniority, but have the best technical expertise are listened to at the front line on the shop floor. Number three, a reluctance to simplify. And what I mean by that is even though operations might seem smooth and without adverse events does not mean that it's simple to do. In fact, the complexity is masked by the fact that the expert users in the system have been able to make it seem exceedingly smooth. The next element is a commitment to resilience. And what that means is ensuring that failures and especially near misses are considered learning opportunities. High reliability organizations are constantly learning, improving, and testing new ways of operating. This takes extremely skilled people with wonderful oversight and the appropriate tools and time to reflect, evaluate, measure, and implement. Number five, and the fifth and final item, is a deference to expertise. And what that means is that taking advantage of the different levels and areas of expertise of team members that can contribute and making sure that the people who have the most expertise, even if they're not the most senior in rank or in seniority of time, are the ones that are listened to. And this is a unique element for high reliability organizations, and it makes sure that decisions that are made down in the hierarchy are respected. These five elements taken together contribute to a very high reliability, and what I mean by that is the rate of defects. So in these organizations, the rate of defects is probably less than 10 to the minus 6, or 1 in a million. This contrasts with healthcare, where the reliability is usually at 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2, or in practical numbers, 1 in 10 to 1 in 100 patients is harmed. It's clear that the reliability of care at healthcare is highly undermined by these types of elements that are missing in healthcare, and therefore we have much room to grow. James Reason's Swiss cheese model is known to many, and in this slide, I talk about this model, and what's at the heart of this model is the relationship between the oversight and decision-making by the organizational and corporate control, and how through their behaviors, actions, and inactions, they create an environment that either supports or undermines providers and contributes factors that influence clinical practice. So from left to right, management makes their decisions that create the conditions, for example, error-producing conditions, for example, the number of nurses per patient, or the number of staff members staffing a hospital at night, or the number of backup fiber optic scopes when one scope is not available for a subsequent patient. These then, of course, enable providers to either create care that's error-free and ultimately prevents maldecisions to propagate to an adverse event. This model of complexity puts the responsibility for all good and all that's bad in healthcare on the shoulders of management because they create the conditions, the climate, and the culture that supports providers. Next slide, you see another more developed example of the Swiss cheese model, which is a multi-causal theory that allows one to see how the defenses in depth can be violated and penetrated by a combination, for example, of punitive policies, production pressures, mixed messages from different levels of management, clumsy and obsolete technology, a sporadic or lack of oversight of trainees, attentions and distractions, and finally, deferred maintenance that takes production pressures to overcome the need to take uh, equipment offline so that there's adequate equipment to provide for the care of patients. 
The key components then of a safety culture are number one, according to Jim Reason, a culture that's highly informed. So those who manage and operate the system have current knowledge and the factors that determine at any given time what is the safety margin of the system. Number two, a culture of reporting where people feel comfortable and safe what Amy Edmondson calls psychological safety, where nurses and physicians and managers at all levels are prepared to report their errors and near misses without a feeling that that might cause them individual harm, that might lead to them being censured, or perhaps even might lead to ridicule and disbarment. Finally, a culture that's just. And what I mean by that is a culture that values and encourages people to speak up, Um, And in fact, even if it causes patient harm, but the providers were well-intended, if they do follow the rules, they should not be punished. Conversely, what the just culture clearly means is that when providers actively violate the rules, when they actively put patients at harm, then there's likely a chance that they will be punished. When you try to measure a culture of safety and safety performance, it's clear that there are multiple dimensions, and those dimensions include the organizational culture, the work unit culture, and of course the interpersonal or interrelated cultures between the unit and the organization at large. Another way of putting this is the relation between the macro system at hospital management, the meso system at the level of units and in between them, and the micro system inside the units. It's clear that these three levels influence and shape the overall culture and its impact on providers. These dimensions, of course, are able to be measured by an organizational safety performance, which ultimately we know can contribute um, in measuring the patient safety indicators. There's an ongoing discussion and debate in the organizational psychology literature on what is a safety culture versus what is a safety climate. So a safety culture we define as a shared group of values, beliefs, and organizational elements that interact to shape our norms. This was defined by Singer in 2007 versus a safety climate, which is really the surface features of a safety culture that is gleaned by the providers. That is to say, what do the providers actually take away? What are their perceptions at any given point in time? What does an intern or a resident or a nurse or a consultant physician think at any given time? You can see there's a tension between a culture and a climate. We know clearly that individual values and beliefs coupled with the structures of work that they're required to perform within leads to behavioral norms. When we want to measure a safety climate, the Safety Patient Safety Climate and Healthcare Organization Survey, or the PSCHO, is used to measure these perceptions of safety climate. And we can see from multiple studies in this case that there are multiple survey questions linked to six demographic areas, leading to 42 safety items, all ranked on a five-point Likert scale. Responses can range from strongly agree to strongly disagree, and we know clearly that a high PPR suggests a poor safety climate, that is to say, a lack of a uniform safety climate that we know contributes or at least uh, enables a culture of adverse care. A survey subscales are determined based on 11 psychometric analyses, and they include things like senior leadership, resources for safety, facility characteristics, unit leadership, unit norms, unit recognition, a fear of blame, psychological safety, and problem responsiveness. In this paper from Peter Pronovos and colleagues, which is in your readings, they clearly showed that you can in fact evaluate a culture of safety and that this culture of safety can be correlated with better care versus the lack of a safety culture may be related to a lack of safety. Now, of course, we're talking here about an association, not causation. What I mean by that is that we're not saying that a certain series of culture or climate characteristics leads to harm. We're saying that when these characteristics are apparent, there's a higher chance that this enables poor care that does not reward safety and likely leads to a poor quality of care. You'll see an example of the questions on the survey of patient safety and the web link where you can find a complete write-up and analysis of the survey. In the next slide, I'd like to talk about a just culture. A just culture recognizes, as we said earlier, the difference between a human error, such as slips, at-risk behavior, such as taking shortcuts, and reckless behavior, that is to say, behavior in which one ignores clear rules and required safety steps. For example, 
barcoding medications or, for example, having a second person double check risky drugs such as vincristine or administering a blood transfusion. All this in contrast to an overreaching no blame approach, which speaks to the fact that if one um, does an adverse step, that does lead to adverse care, but they meant it in goodwill, they were following the rules, they should not be punished. It's important to note that the response is not based on the severity of the event. That is to say, even if a patient is harmed by an action of a provider, but they didn't break the rules, they weren't at risk, and they meant well, they should not be punished. On the other hand, Reckless behavior in which providers clearly violate norms and rules and standards, refusing to do timeouts, for example, for surgical procedures, refusing to do a double check on blood, refusing to follow clear directions, that would merit punitive action, even underscore, even if the patient was not harmed. In this slide, you see an example of the Columbia Space Shuttle. In 2003, as you know, the Space Shuttle blew up and all the astronauts died. But NASA, of course, was focusing on how the culture contributed to the adverse outcomes. In the next slide, you see a capture of the Washington Post right after the space shuttle inquiry came out. And the title reads, The report blames flawed NASA culture for tragedy. This wasn't caused by technical reasons like the O-ring and other aspects, but in fact, it was attributed to a flawed culture that allowed the culture to not respect ambiguity and uncertainty by the engineers and ultimately led to an adverse outcome. In the next slide, I've excerpted a paragraph from that report that reads as follows. Cultural norms tend to be fairly resilient. The norms bounce back into shape after being stretched or bent. Beliefs held in common resist alteration. This culture at NASA acted over time to resist externally imposed changes. By the eve of the Columbia accident, institutional practices that were in effect at the time of the Challenger accident had returned to NASA, end quote. In effect, even though after Challenger, a lot of work had been done to help NASA get their culture of safety back in order, in fact, seven years later, those same elements contributed to a culture of blame, a punitive culture, lack of psychological safety, which together contributed to the tragedy. In the hospital setting, we've done a lot of work on assessing the culture in the operating theater. And in this slide, you see an example of one of our papers published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. In this study, we looked at three different surgical teams at the University of Miami, at Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School, and Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. We surveyed entire cardiac surgical teams, physicians, nurses, allied health, and other members of the team, and we asked them about the culture of adverse event reporting, we asked them about OR management, and we asked them about their safety culture. In the study, we had a 72% response rate. We found significant differences in the sense of empowerment, in the sense of personal and organizational safety, and in organizational backing between these three elite organizations. In detail, what we found was that 45% of respondents felt that the outcomes in their units were not safe enough. 33% of respondents felt that errors of the same kind kept on recurring, that is to say, learning was not occurring. 47% felt that the administration was not sensitive to patient safety issues. And finally, 40% felt that the patient was not told the whole story about their care, particularly when adverse outcomes occurred. This is quite remarkable. We're talking about a very high-risk setting of pediatric cardiac surgery. So again, these findings highlight the importance of understanding how the culture in high-risk settings can enable and contribute to adverse care. Ron Westrom at Michigan State University has done a lot of work on trying to delineate the key steps that lead to a development of a culture of safety. In this slide, you see the five steps moving from left to right, from a pathological culture that punishes and penalizes people, and as long as you don't get caught, everything is fine, but if you speak up, you get censured and punished. The next step is a reactive culture where safety is important, but we don't actually proactively act on it. We wait until it comes to our attention. The next level in the safety culture is a calculative one where we have systems to try to manage hazards and try to eliminate them beforehand. The fourth 
step in this ladder of culture is a proactive, where we actively seek continuous improvement. And finally, is a generative or high reliability culture, which is safety is really how we do business around here. These five steps highlighted by Ron Westrom are characterized by a culture that's increasingly informed from worst to best or from pathological to generative, and where there's increasing trust and accountability that leads employees and management to believe that they can speak up when they feel that a patient or an organizational performance is not up to par. In this slide, we highlight how different organizational cultures handle safety information. From the worst environment where we don't want to know what goes on, whistleblowers are shot, responsibility is shirked, to a mid-level in which we want to know some of the information and failures lead to local repairs, to the one on the right, which is the most perfectionist model in which we actively seek out problems, responsibility is shared, new ideas are welcome, and failures are welcome as opportunities for learning. In the next slide, we have a slide of the Just Culture algorithm. And again, this lays out what are the core steps that you might inculcate in your organization as you move from your present culture towards a just culture. What's clear from the work that we've looked at and others is that this may take several years, perhaps as much as five to 10 years to move from a culture that might be very reactive and pathological based on Westrom's approach to one that's generative, proactive, and models itself after high reliability organizational culture. At the core of any improvement of a high reliability nature is an organizational culture. This culture ultimately supports responsibility and accountability by management and employees. This can help lead to process optimization and standardization. This can lead to outcome measurement and monitoring in which employees feel accountable to the outcome. And ultimately, in an iterative cycle, can lead to ongoing improvement and sustained outcomes. This is at the heart of an improved organizational culture that's just, that's safe, and that leads to outcomes that are usually in the range of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6, so-called Six Sigma or high reliability culture. This is very, very different than a culture in which 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2 of patients get harmed. This is really a low reliability culture, and at the heart of that tension is the journey that we need to face in healthcare. Finally, in my last slide, I wanted to highlight some work done by HPI in which we lay out the journey to reliability of healthcare. That is to say, how do we move from a reliability that's very low at 10 to the minus 1, that is to say 1 in 10 interactions or processes failed, ultimately to a culture of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6, which is really the highest of human endeavor. And as you can see from this slide, there are three key vectors and elements that are key in order to get to reliability. Number one, process redesign, which is focused on evidence-based best practice, a focus on simplifying so providers understand and interventions are made sense to them. Number three, in which there's tactical improvements at all steps of the way, for example, process bundles, surgical checklists, and fall prevention protocols. The next key vector is moving towards a culture of safety and a just culture in which core values are integrated throughout the organization. Behavior expectations are set and expected for all, including management. People are hired for fit, not just based on their clinical skills, but also based on their values. And finally, there's a fair, just, and clear accountability so that when bad things happen, people feel comfortable to speak up. When people are reckless, however, and adverse care happens, people are held accountable. The highest level, which allows us to get to a reliability of 10 to the minus 6, is of course a complete integration of process redesign, a culture of safety, and human factors integration, in which we integrate intuitive design, in which there's constant sense-making by employees in the organization, and in which people feel comfortable and safe. They feel the psychological safety to speak up to the colleagues, to themselves, and to management when they feel that errors are occurring or that processes are faulty design. In essence, this level includes a continuous failure mode and effects analysis in which we're constantly analyzing processes, and we're moving from an entity and environment which is constantly risk and rife for problems, and we're trying to minimize, mitigate, and prevent these complex processes from failing and leading from near misses to adverse care, in essence, not just promising the patient that the care that we deliver will be of high value, but actually delivering high value safe care that mitigates the risk of health care and helps to lead to a high reliability outcome. Thank you. Thank you.